Often King. Thank you so much for doing this. It's lovely to finally meet you. Yeah, yeah, you too. So I'm here with, uh, now I'm terrible with names. If I mispronounce this, please correct me, with Kwasim Kassam. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, who is the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the author of Extremism, a Philosophical Na Analysis, and a professor of philosophy at Warwick University. And we're gonna be talking about his book, Extremism, A Philosophical Analysis, which you can purchase at amazon.com. And this is an absolutely fantastic book. I read it, I think in three days, but I've got a million questions about it and a million things I wanted to ask about it because it's so fascinating. And I'm so pleased that a philosopher actually wrote a book about this topic because I thought that this was something that philosophers were sort of not all that interested in. So I was curious just to start with, um, what got you interested in this? What made you decide to write a book on extremism? Uh, well, the, the, the simple answer is I was asked to write a book on extremism. Uh, the, the publisher approached me and asked if I'd take it on. But the, the reason the publisher asked me to do it is that I recently published a book on conspiracy theories. Um, and I've also been writing papers uh, on terrorism. Uh, so uh, extremism, in, in a way, is a natural extension of the work I've been, I've been doing anyway. Um, and then the question is, you know, why do philosophers generally steer clear of these sorts of topics? Uh, and that, that's a really good question that, you know, says a lot about the way that professional philosophy works and the rather sort of abstract topics that philosophers are, are interested in and which I was interested in in my earlier, in my earlier academic life. But I've, I've really turned my mind now to what I think of as these very, uh, very pressing practical questions. and. I think it's important that philosophers with their training should actually try to think about these questions and, and, and contribute to our understanding of them. I absolutely agree with you. Um, now, because we only have an hour here, um, I can't go into all of the issues that were raised in this book. So I thought we would just focus on um, ideological extremism itself and psychological mm -hmm. extremism um, and how those two sort of relate to the other concepts that come in and out of the book. If you want to come back on the podcast to discuss your views on fanaticism or fundamentalism, we can obviously do that too. But I thought today we'd concentrate on extremism. So can you, for our audience, sort of give a basic idea of how you define extremism in this book? Um, so, so basically, extremism, as I see it, is not just one thing. It's, it can be understood in several different ways. And the book is organized around a distinction between three varieties of extremism. Uh, so first of all, there's what I call methods extremism. So a methods extremist is simply someone who supports the use of extreme methods in support of their political objectives. So then you get into a whole discussion of what counts as an extreme method, but for, for most purposes, extreme methods are, are violent methods. So that's methods extremism. Um, then there's ideological extremism. So an ideological extremist is simply someone who has an extremist ideology. Um, so if you think of ideologies as organized along a kind of spectrum, so supposing you have the left to right spectrum. Um, so an extremist ideology will then be an ideology that's at the far end, at the fringe of a spectrum of ideologies. Right? So extreme left, extreme right, they would count as extremist ideologies. And maybe there are other ways of classifying ideologies as well. But the basic thought is that, is that you're an extremist in the ideological sense if your ideology is extremist. And then the last type of extremism I talk about is psychological extremism. Uh, so, so this is the idea that being an extremist in the psychological sense isn't so much about what your particular political beliefs are or about the methods you use. It's more about what I call your mindset. It's more about um, how you think about political questions and what your attitude is to, uh, for example, dissent and opposition and violence. So a psychological extremist is someone who has what I call an extremist mindset. Uh, and quite a lot of the book is concerned with trying to spell out what makes a person's mindset an extremist mindset. And for, for my money, that's the most interesting part of the book. Okay, <clears throat> so 
talk a bit about what you think an extreme mindset, extremist mindset is. What are some of the necessary and sufficient conditions of having an extremist mindset? Yeah, so, so um, what I do is I, I kind of identify various components. I mean, I wouldn't claim that these are necessary or sufficient, but, but these are certainly typical of, of the extremist mindset. So first of all, I want to say that extremists are people who have certain obsessions or preoccupations. Uh, so extremists are, are preoccupied with what I call purity. So extremists are preoccupied with ideological purity or with, um, or with, or with racial purity or with religious purity. Um, so, so this is the purity preoccupation. So, so the thought here is that extremists uh, are very upset by the idea of kind of diluting um, whatever they think is important. So they're opposed to racial mixing, they're opposed to religious um, dilution of any sort um, or ideological dilution. Then there are extremist attitudes. Um, so uh, your mindset is partly made up of your attitudes. So among the attitudes that I think of as extremist attitudes, one is a great hostility to compromise. Um, so uh, extremists think of compromises as you know, rotten compromises. Uh, so that's an example of an extremist um, attitude. Uh, and, and then there are particular extremist um, uh, thinking styles. Uh, so extremists tend to engage in conspiratorial thinking, apocalyptic thinking, uh, in catastrophizing and various other kinds of thinking. So these are just illustrations of what I mean by, you know, a mindset. Um, and, and I think the thing about preoccupations is, is, is a thing that I found most interesting to write about. And I talked about, I just gave you an example, the purity preoccupation, but there are others as well, you know, so the preoccupation with victimhood. So extremists think of themselves you know, as uh, as victims of, of persecution or oppression by other people. And these, uh, um, uh, fant these are often fantasies of persecution. So I think that incels are extremists who have suffer from fantasies of, uh, of persecution. Uh, extremists are also, on the whole, preoccupied with their own virtue. You know, they think of themselves as um, as, as uh, you know, as, as the good guys, you know, as protecting or defending their religion or their, their race or their ideology against the bad guys. Uh, so that's another example of, of a kind of extremist um, uh, preoccupation. They're also preoccupied with humiliation. So extremists very often make a big deal out of their supposed humiliation by the, you know, by the outsiders, by the enemy. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's a very interesting part of the extremist mindset. So, so this is not intended as a kind of complete account of it, but I think that if you look at actual historical extremists, individuals who we naturally think of it, or, or, of it as extremists, I think you'll find pretty much all of these um, preoccupations play a big part uh, in, their, in their psychology, um, along with the other elements I, I, I mentioned. Okay, so is it an important part of your explanation of this of the extremist mindset that these preoccupations and beliefs are largely delusional so we wouldn't say that someone is an extremist if they felt persecuted and were obsessed in that way but as an actual fact they were persecuted because let's say they lived in yeah. south africa during apartheid or they were yeah. a black yeah. person in the mid 19th century in america so does it have yeah. to be delusional yeah yeah so I, I i i take that to be you know part of it i mean it's an interesting question whether you could be you could have a, a, an extremist preoccupation with persecution if you really are being persecuted, you know, like uh, the old joke about, you know, I might be something about, you know, them being, being paranoid, but they really are out to get you, you know, so, so there would be some question about that. But on the whole, I think that, you know, if you think about the example you just gave of the ANC in, in, in South Africa, I mean, obviously they were preoccupied with their persecution under apartheid, but they had very good reason to be preoccupied. They really were um, persecuted. They really were victims. Um, but if you think about, you know, extremists um, that, that are more clearly recognizable, I mean, I mentioned in the case of incels, but there are lots of others, you know, so, um, uh, extremists who claim that they're persecuted by, you know, the Jews, for example, um, you know, anti-Semitic extremists, where there is no such persecution, there is no oppression, in fact, by the group that they identify. And that's when I think it, it makes more sense to talk about extremism. So that's why in the book I talk about extremists as people with fantasies of persecution or fantasies of victimhood. 
Um, they, they, they love to think of themselves as got at, even when they aren't being got at, and in fact are doing the getting at themselves. Okay. So is it impossible on, on your view to think of somebody who might be persecuted, who was also an extremist? So for instance, uh, we, we could, might talk about the civil rights movements in America in the 60s and 70s. They're obviously good civil rights activists that we all can look back on fondly. But there were some who many people at least say were extremists, even though African-Americans were in a sense oppressed at that time. Would you be able to consider that within your conceptual framework of extremism or does that not fit? Yeah, yeah. No, it, fit, it, fit, it fits in the, in the following sense, right? So, so um, it, for example, they might have other elements of the extremist mindset. Um, so that would be one sense in which they might be extremists, but they might also be extremists in the ideological or in the method sense. You know, so if you take, I mean, this is a very, a very difficult question, right? But if you take the case of um, uh, civil rights activists or, or uh, the African National Congress in South Africa, I mean, although they were in fact victims of persecution, um, so at, at various times they resorted to terrorism. Um, uh, in their armed struggle. Um, so this was true in South Africa, certainly. Uh, now, some people would say, well, that makes them, that would have made them extremists in the method sense. Right? They used extreme methods in pursuit of their political objectives, even though those objectives were, you know, were, were, were just. Um, and that then gets you into the whole question of whether, you know, terrorism is, in and of itself an extreme method of achieving your political objectives. Um, I mean, I'd be inclined to say that it is, um, but there are quite complicated questions about the distinction between terrorism and other kinds of violence, which I think um, can legitimately be used in pursuit of one's political objectives without making one a terrorist. I mean, states use violence all the time, right? And they aren't all terrorists. Um, so, so in answer to your question, you know, if you are, I mean, your question is, if you are the victim of actual persecution and you are preoccupied with your actual persecution, can you nevertheless be an extremist? Answer, yes, right? because you can have the other elements of the extremist mindset. You can be a methods extremist. You could even be an ideological extremist. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's conceptually possible for extremist positions to suddenly become mainstream political positions, even though they are extremist? Um, Yes. So um, I, what, what I think is possible is the following, that there are positions that are regarded as extremist positions at a given time that at a later time are not regarded as extremist positions. I think that is perfectly possible. So if you take the case of the um, abolitionists uh, in, in the States, so, the, um, uh, so they were radical abolitionists campaigning against the the immediate um, emancipation of the slaves with no compensation for slave owners. So this was the radical wing of the abolitionist movement. Um, now, at, at the time, I think many of them would have been regarded as extremists or fanatics, and indeed many of them regarded themselves as extremists or fanatics. Um, and maybe by the standard there, characterization. Um, but now you wind the clock forward and say, well, you know, is someone who is campaigning against slavery today an extremist or a fanatic? Well, no, obviously not. Right? Uh, I mean, so, you know, that slavery does exist in various places in the world, and there are people who campaign against it, and those people are not extremists. But then there's an even more difficult question to ask, which is, all right, well, supposing we now ask, ask ourselves, a question about the past. Should we now today um, agree that the radical abolitionists were extremists? Even if relative to their day they were, should we agree that they were extremists? And I would say, no, I don't think we should agree to that. Although, uh, I, I mean, we shouldn't agree to that because what, what they were was, was radical Democrats, right, effectively. I mean, they wanted, you know, um, they wanted the emancipation of the slaves and that is not an extremist position. But of course we can say that while at the same time acknowledging that by the standards of their day, of course they were, um, they were extremists. So there's this thing that people talk about, political scientists talk about called the Overton window. Um, so the Overton window is, is a window, is as it were, 
a spectrum of views that are politically mainstream at a given time in history. Right? Um, and the point about the Overton window is that it shifts over time. So um, the idea that um, uh, women should have the vote today is right in the middle of the Overton window. No one would argue about it, right? But it wind the clock back a hundred years and it wouldn't have been in the middle of the Overton window. It would have been regarded as a kind of fringe, fringe position or perhaps it, perhaps 150 years ago, it would have been almost unthinkable. So that's an example of, of how what counts as extremist or what is seen as extremist in one era may not be in another era. Um, but that's a claim about you know, how things are perceived. Right? If you then say, yeah, but is it, was it really extremist to think that women should have the vote? Whatever people thought, should we agree that it was really, it was actually an extremist point of view? Well, no, why should we agree with that? Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to kind of step outside um, history and, and, and deliver some kind of objective verdict on what is and what is not an extremist or a fringe position. I mean, of course, what we say in answer to these questions is bound to be shaped by where we are in history and by uh, what we take to be um, uh, a, a kind of reasonable view or an unreasonable view. And I think there's no escaping that. Okay, so one of the interesting things that you, you raise are issues where when the Overton window shifts, it seems like progress of some sort has happened. Can you countenance on your view shifts in the Overton window that are quite negative, where actually things that should have been seen as extremists in the past suddenly become mainstream? Uh, because many people today think a lot of fashionable views that are bandied about in education and politics and the media were just 10 years ago considered extremists and they were considered extremists for good reason. But what do you think about that? Yeah, no, of course, I, of course, I think that I, I think that can happen. I mean, shifts in the Overton window don't necessarily signify progress. They can also signify regress. Um, I mean, if you think about um, the Overton window in in Germany in the 1930s, compared to the Overton window in Germany in a previous, you know, some some time before that. I mean, of course, the Overton window shifted in the sense that persecution of the Jews became a kind of mainstream, you know, became sort of mainstream. <laughs> In, in Nazi Germany, whereas it perhaps wasn't mainstream to the same extent before. Um, and that's, that's a clear, you know, that's a clear um, decline, a, a clear uh, re regression. So, I, I mean, in if, it, what, one of the interesting things about the Overton window, I think, is that, is that you know, politicians on all sides, both, of, both liber liberal and uh, conservative politicians are all engaged in the business of trying to shift the Overton window in their preferred direction. So they're all in the business of trying to, trying to make it the case that, that what they think is in the middle of the Overton window, whereas what the other side thinks is outside the Overton window. And, and, and if you can move the Overton window um, um, through you know, media or political campaigning, um, I mean, that can be a highly you know, effective uh, uh, technique for getting yourself elected. Right? Because, I mean, however crazy your views are, if you can make people think that your views are, the in, are, are mainstream, they're more likely to vote for you than if they think that they aren't mainstream. Uh, so that's, that's part of, you know, that's part of practical politics. And I think that all sides are engaged in this constant battle over the precise location of the, of the Overton window relative to their own views. So do you think it's not illegitimate for someone today to critique a mainstream political figure by saying they represent views that are extremist, even though they're in the mainstream. That would be an absolutely, you know, absolutely legitimate, um, legitimate thing to do. I mean, if you think about um, um, what I see is uh, as the radicalization of the Republican Party in the US, I mean, the Republican Party has clearly moved substantially to the right. Um, in the last in the last uh, t ten years or so, in the, certainly in the era of Trump and the and the Tea Party. Now, I mean, if if the Republicans were to win the next presidential election, um, you could say that their views were mainstream. Right, if they won an election 
then in some obvious sense that would make their views mainstream. But that wouldn't mean that their views weren't extremist. All that would, all, it would only mean that the mainstream had gone <laughs> extremist, as it were. And, you know, and then it's then you get into the question: is well, on what grounds could you say that? Right? I mean, on what grounds could you say that the mainstream was now um, extremist? And the answer to that would be: well, you'd have to think of it in terms of positioning on an ideological spectrum. So now it would be you know, where you stand on the left to right spectrum. So if, so when I talk about the Republican Party being radicalized, what I mean by that is that the Republican Party has moved substantially to the right along the left to right spectrum. Um, I think it's also moved um, uh, 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 on what I would like to call the authoritarianism spectrum. You know, so ideologies vary in how authoritarian they are. And I think that the Republican ideology has become more authoritarian as well. Um, and, uh, it, you know, there's nothing to say that the Republicans won't win an election, despite, despite having uh, made, these, made these shifts uh, in, their ideological, um, in their ideological positioning. Uh, so that could, you know, that could, you know, that could certainly happen. And it, of course, it's a sad historical fact that extremists sometimes do win um, uh, elections and they, they do um, persuade the public that this is this is the you know what they think is the thing to think and and one of the you know one of the really concerning things about the world today and this is not just about the US but also various places in Europe has been the rise of right or extreme right political parties which are now actually serious contenders for you know for power and in some cases have actually won democratic elections in their countries um, and um, in effect, what they've done is that they've made their extreme views mainstream, but their views are still extreme. Okay. Is it also a part of your view that the left in the last 10 years has not shifted further to the left? It's only the right that shifted further to the right? Uh, that would be my, that would be my view. I, I mean, you know, you'd have to look at it on a country by country basis. Um, but I think on the, on the whole, certainly in Europe, this is true that um, um, the, the, the so-called the so-called left um, has has essentially had its agenda to some extent dictated by the right you know so I, I mean I'll give you you know give you an example if you if you think of think of the UK I mean think about the whole brexit debate in the UK I mean this is just I mean, whether you think of Brexit as right wing or left wing is, is debatable, but supposing you think of it as basically a policy of the right. Um, I, I, I mean, the Labour Party in the UK now is, is acquiescing, as far as Brexit is concerned, is not opposing it anymore. Um, uh, so, so that's an example of a, of, of a sort of left political party, you know, essentially being, being manoeuvred, being moved to a more right wing position. I mean, the US is a kind of interesting case, you know, what one thinks about the Democratic Party in the US and its positioning. Um, but the, as I understand it, the Democratic Party itself has a number of different factions. Um, and, you know, there is a more so-called moderate faction in the Democratic Party, um, whose policies, I think, you know, would in a previous generation have been regarded as mainstream Republican policies. Um, I think that's certainly true of many of Obama's policies. But then there's also a, you know, a, more, um, a, a more radical um, liberal wing of the Democratic Party, which, whose policies may have moved somewhat to the left. I don't, I don't really know, but they're certainly not, um, they, they don't appear to be vastly popular anyway. Okay, what would you say to somebody who says, it's true that on economic issues, the left to a large extent has acquiesced to the right, but there has been an explosion of radical extreme social and cultural issues on the left in the last 10 years that have greatly influenced not just the left, but everything from educational institutions to pop culture with regards mm -hmm. to issues like trans rights, uh, how pervasive misogyny is, how racist society is, environmentalism and so on, positions that mm -hmm. even left-wing people are often uncomfortable with because they seem so extreme relative to what the left mm -hmm. believed in 2010, let's say, what would you say to that? Well, I think I think there's an element of there's an element of truth in that, but I I think I think one also needs to be careful to distinguish between, you know, what it is or is not acceptable to say today, and you know the facts on the ground. You know, so certain so certain kinds of racist talk. I mean, you know, 40 years ago when I was growing up in the UK, the use of racial slurs in public was absolutely commonplace. Um, 
it isn't commonplace to, today um, or homophobic discourse, for example. So there are lots of things that people now won't say, which they might have said 30 or 40 years ago. But, you know, it's a, it's a further question to what extent that, you know, the facts on the ground have changed. I mean, you know, to what extent, um, you know, these societies are, are less, in fact, less racist, less homophobic uh, or, or whatever. I mean, maybe they are to some extent, but I, I don't, I don't um, feel instinctively that the progress um, has been quite as great as 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 you might think. Looking at you know look just looking at as it were polite conversation. Um, polite conversation has certainly changed. That's fascinating um, because a lot of people would say that it's not really about how much racism or sexism or transphobia has changed. That is, is the hallmark of what's changed in the left. What's changed is the kind of explanations for explaining these phenomenon for explaining the whole of society as an oppressive structure that's sort yeah. of designed to keep certain people down, that that mm -hmm. has been the major change in the last 10 years on the left. It's not claims about how much or how little mm -hmm. bigotry exists. What would you say to that? Yeah, no, I, 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 agree, I agree that there is, great, there is greater clarity, I think, on the left about, about these issues, um, you know, in the US context about white supremacy and, and, and the, the impact of uh, um, slavery and, and 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 so on on American politics today. So I think that is certainly true on 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 the, on the progressive side, the liberal side of American politics. Um, to what extent this is, you know, this this is this is now a kind of mainstream thing is is much you know is much less clear. And in a way, I think that the you know the success of um, the success of the Trump Republicans is partly attributable to a kind of backlash. But, um, against that um, uh, advance on uh, on the progressive, you know, on the progressive side. I mean, I don't want you know, I don't, I, I don't want to paint a black and white picture here, right? I mean, you know, clearly there has been progress. Um, some of it real, some of it at, at least apparent progress. Um, uh, but it, 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 I suspect, it's not overall at a societal level as great as, as, as one might have hoped, even though I absolutely agree with you that there are, um, you know, there are, there are uh, constituencies in, in politics in, in, in states and in Europe, which are, I think, more enlightened than they, than they once were about these questions and certainly more, you know, much more sensitive to these issues um, than, 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 you know, than they were. But, um, you know what will what will we say about all that if if Trump is re-elected? You know what 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 conclusions will we draw in that case about about the progress of these ideas at a societal level? That's interesting. Um, yeah, th this is this is fascinating. So, is your view that insofar as the left is adopting these new explanatory frameworks for explaining misogyny or racism or transphobia, that this is progress? rather than the mainstreaming of a certain kind of leftist extremism, which was very predominant in college campuses, let's say in the late 20th century. So do you think this is progress on the left? I th yeah, I think it's, I think it's progress. Um, um, it's very interesting that you, that you use the, you know, use the word mainstreaming. I think that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting concept. And, and what I would want to say about that is that, is that, um, the right has actually been far more effective at mainstreaming its ideas than 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 you know than the left has been. Um, I, I, I think that um, uh, these ideas that you're that you're describing, you know, ideas about the historical origins of misogyny and racism and so on, um, you know, are they are they you know have, are they mainstream? Have they been mainstreamed? Uh, in the context of, you know, the, um, American electorate as a whole, I would be doubtful about that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert in American politics, but I, from, you know, just as an out, as an outsider, I think that uh, I would find that somewhat difficult to to believe. So, would you say that a good way of thinking about the mainstream is what people are willing to vote for in the election booth, not what's acceptable to say to keep your job, for instance? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be that would that, that would be sort of 
you know, it's kind of a reductive view, but it's quite a good view. You know, I mean, you know, this this uh, this also deals with the, with the well known phenomenon. So, I, it, it, I don't know if you have an equivalent in the states, but in Britain, they have this phenomenon of the shy conservative voter. So, opinion polls always overstate support for the Labour Party in the run up to elections, uh, because basically, lots of people who intend to vote conservative will not con own up to that intention because they think it's sort of so you know it's embarrassing or or, or sort of socially uncomfortable to admit to being a conservative voter. Uh, but when they get into the polling booth, they still vote for the conservatives. You know, and for all I know, you have something similar in the States, you know, with the phenomenon of maybe there are shy Republicans who, you know, who maybe wouldn't be very uncomfortable uh, saying to their work colleagues that they're going to vote for Trump at the next election, but maybe they will. Right? So, uh, so if you say, well, OK, so what, you know, where do they stand politically? Well, I think that you know the vote is 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 actually tells you a lot about where they stand politically more than um, um, conversations they might have with you know with with work colleagues who they don't want to offend or upset. Um, so I, I, I you know I, I think that all these questions about you know what is or isn't mainstream are very difficult you know are very difficult to answer. But but it seems to me that if if a policy is adopted by a major political party, and that party then wins a free and fair election. Uh, then I think it. I think you can say, you know, reasonably fairly that that policy is now a main is now in the mainstream. Okay, that's interesting. So this again deals with a lot of interesting issues. A lot of people feel like um, they live in a society which which just being taken over by extremism when mm. what they vote for is the same thing that could get them sacked from their job or the same thing that would be impossible to say and make a movie or the same thing that would be impossible to say and, and be given some sort of an award um, in polite society. They feel that um, that's the extremism. If we lived in a non-extremist society, then what people actually think when they vote for would be something that we could talk about and discuss and debate about without huge stigmas coming from polite society trying to suppress what people think. Do you disagree with that? I think I, I think I do. I mean, I, I don't really see that the, that the concept of extremism is anything very much to do with it here. I mean, of course, it's true that that that, um, um, that there, there are things that people might have said in public in the 1970s, which they would not say today for the simple reason that saying that saying those things today would would get them into all sorts of trouble. Um, with their employers or work colleagues or on Twitter or wherever wherever it is. So I think that you know that's a that's a genuine phenomenon. Now with respect to that phenomenon, there are various questions that you can ask. One is is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Right, that people can't go around saying these things that they used to be able to say before. Right, so that's one thing. Now I mean I I mean I think it's a good thing. Right, um, I, I don't see it as I don't see it as a bad thing that people can't you know go, uh, can't say some of the things that they used to say. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the 1960s and 1970s. I think that's actually progress. Second question is, well, okay, but what about free speech then? Does this mean that people's free speech is restricted? Um, well, I think that's an arguable case. You could say, you could say that, that in, you know, in, so, in some sense, people are less free to say whatever, they, whatever is on their mind. I think that, you know, maybe that's true. But is that extremism? Well, I don't see that that's extremism. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the fact that societal norms evolve uh, and that, you know, things that were acceptable at some point in the past are not acceptable now. You know, and, 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 and calling that extremism, I think, is just, a, is, just, is just unhelpful and a misnomer. I don't see what it has to do with extremism. It's just this fact that, you know, societal norms change, they evolve, and it's always been the case that there are that there were things that you could that you could get away with saying and things that you couldn't get away with saying. That that has always always been true. What has changed today is that those things have changed themselves. And of course, you know, because of the internet and Twitter and so on, you know, the blowback is pretty instantaneous um, if you breach the rules. But the idea that they were, you know, that that you know, some golden age when you could just say whatever you liked, I think that's I think that's a myth. Okay. Um, I know I agree with you. There, there are ab absolutely social norms that have changed. Uh, I mean, even not necessarily um, ones that we even think about all that much. Like it was very difficult to criticize the Iraq War in two thousand three, yeah. which yeah. you talked about yeah. in the book. Um, yeah. 
So it's not just that all the social norms go left necessarily. Yeah. Um, sometimes they go right too. But yeah. what I'm interested in um, is, do you have a worry that there's something about social norms stopping people from saying what they think, which is dangerous to society, independently of who's right and who's wrong? Because it's dangerous to have a society that believes things they can't say, because yeah. then they do go yeah. vote. And when they vote, they're probably going to vote a lot worse than they would if they could say these things and then have discussions about them and have their minds changed. What do you think about that? I, I think this is a, a, a very kind of complicated question, right? So, so let me let me just give you an example from my own, you know, from my own life. Okay, so so I um, was born and brought up in Kenya in East Africa and uh, came to the UK uh, in the 1970s when I was in my early my early teens. Um, now. Uh, at that time in the UK, um, basically anyone of um, South Asian origin, which I, which is what I am, um, was 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 um, called a Paki. Right, so Paki was short for Pakistani, which was seen as a form of a form of insult. Right, so essentially anyone anyone who looked slightly you know Asian, uh, South Asian, was 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 called was referred to as an effing Paki. I still um, get called Paki. So, <laughs> right. Well, it was a very offensive word in those days. And um, um, when when people were, you know, South Asian people were beaten up, which they frequently were at that time, that was called Paki Bashi. Mm -hmm. Now, like when I was, at, you know, when I was at school, um, being called a Paki was absolutely normal. I mean, it was a just, you know, it happened a hundred times a day. Um, being called it to your face, your friends being called packies, um, you know, watching, you know, watching a, a, a soccer game where, you know, one of your friends gets, gets hold of the ball and people on the sidelines say, you know, kill that effing packy bastard, right? Now, okay, so what's on their mind? Their mind uh, so the, what's on the mind of people who said that was, you know, the great antipathy to, to people of, of certain ethnic origin. And social norms at the time were such that they were able to express that antipathy without any restraint or any fear of any of any adverse consequences. If somebody did that today, in most circumstances, they would they would they would be in serious they would be in serious trouble. Now, if you ask me, okay, so wouldn't it be better if society was so you know free that uh, that 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 this this virulent racist would could perf perfectly well stand along the side of the pitch in a soccer game, and 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 uh, say things like "kill that effing packy bastard," uh, wouldn't that be better? If that's what on their if that's what's on their mind, why shouldn't they just be able to say it? Right. Well, I don't really feel the force of that, you know, at all. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that sort of, you know those that sort of uh, racial abuse. Is not acceptable today. Uh, it's good that it's not acceptable today, uh, not least because it's a form of oppression of, of racial minorities. And the idea that you know somehow we it would you know society would be better off if you know however regrettable it is if people really think that then they should just be free to come out and say it. Um, I, I think civilization is partly a matter of not being free to say or not feeling able to say. It everything that is on your mind. That's part of what it is to be civilized. And, and I think that, um, you, you know, the idea, you know, when people say, you know, it, it, it's just surely it's better that people should just say what's on their mind, right? But, you know, even if we don't like what, what they have to say, they should be, just be free to say. Well, I mean, of course, I, you know, I feel the force of that. Of course, I feel the force of that. I'm in favor of free speech. But at the same time, you have to, you, have, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, well, what are these things that people want to say? And what is their impact on the people they say these things to? It's not just a one-way, you know, it's not just a one-way street, you know. So, um, you know, is it okay, you know, if somebody walks into your restaurant and you say, I don't, I'm not going to serve you because I don't like Asian people or I don't like gay people. Uh, is that okay? Well, I want to say no. I mean, leaving aside the legality of it, it's also not okay, right? Just as a matter of the way I want my society, society to be. So I think that, you know, with all of these things, we're always having to strike a balance between, you know, on the one hand, freedom of speech and freedom of conscience and all that good stuff. But on the other hand, the fact that the things that people say actually make a difference, they affect other people's lives, they cause, you know, they cause genuine harm to other people. 
I mean, I was, you know, I, like many of my, you know, my friends at school, I think I can claim that I was harmed by, by being subjected to that kind of discourse. So, you know, I, 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 if people can't do that now, great. I'm really happy about that. I'm really happy about okay. that. Oh, wait, see, it seems like what we're conflating here is there's, there's two different kinds of horrible speech here. The first is just an attempt to dominate you on the basis of some sort of racist aggression, like saying F and Packy. But there's a yeah. second kind of speech um, that maybe we wouldn't want social norms to completely suppress, which is something to the effect that Paki shouldn't be in this country because they do this, that, and the other. Yeah. If someone believed that second belief and it was expressed in a political array rather than a dominating way, do you worry that if they were forced to suppress that, that would actually be dangerous for Asian people, uh, more dangerous than having the conversation and saying, no, that view is wrong, here's why and having yeah. debate. Yeah, no, I, I, I sort of agree with that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't appreciate the use of that particular epithet, but if, you know, uh, I mean, certainly I don't think that people should not be allowed to express strong opposition to immigration or immigration from particular parts of the world. I mean, I don't, you know, I think that is something that people should be free to express and they are free to express, right? I mean, after all, I mean, you know, uh, uh, someone who was elected president of the United States in 2016, gave expression to that, uh, you know, that line of, of thought um, about Mexicans, for example, right? So, I mean, the idea that, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, everyone was running scared and didn't feel able to say these things, it's complete nonsense. I think it's just a sort of, it, it, it's just one of these, it's just one of these things that, 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 that people like to say that, you know, that somehow they feel very restricted and, you know, they're, if, they, if they're against immigration, they don't feel they can come out and say it. But I think that's just, I just find that unbelievable. I mean, people say these things all the time and, uh, and, and not only do they say them, some of the people who say these things get elected to your Senate, to your Congress, you know, get elected to the White House. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a kind of great myth about, you know, what you can and can't say about topics like immigration. Um, um, I mean, of, of course, you know, people then say, talk about, um, Looking at it from the other, you know, from the other side, I mean, there are people on the left who want to talk about, um, um, you know, slave the history of slavery in the U.S. or the genocide of the Na Native Americans, and there are people on the right who don't want to hear that, right? Um, you know, who find who find who you know who uh, who feel very uncomfortable about hearing things like that. But again, I think that you know, just as the people on the right have the right to say that they, you know, they they're, they're against immigration, I think liberals are perfectly entitled to point out you know, point to uncomfortable facts about America's own past. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. So <clears throat> it seems like one of the real dividing lines in the culture wars at the moment is whether kind of effective activism in play society is a form of extremism. Now, what's interesting is your book goes in great detail to explain how things like terrorism or violence are forms of extremism. Um, and it talks about extremist mindsets in, in ways that are quite eloquent and in, eloquent and interesting. Um, what I'm interested in is, do you ever see activism that isn't violent, um, that's not really uh, violating anyone's law, anyone's rights, let's say, as still extremist because of the psychological violence in which that activism is done and is effective? Um. In general, no. I mean, you, you, one would need to look at the look at the specifics, you know, of the example, right? So, so, I mean, one thing I don't really talk about in the book, but which I'm actually quite interested in at the moment, is the relationship between extremism and radicalism. Um, so, a lot of a lot of you know the great advances I think in human history have been the result of radicals, you know, radicals campaigning and acting. You know, so there were the suffragettes campaigning for women's uh, votes. There were the abolitionists, um, um, you know, radicals uh, in the U.S. in the 1960s, you know, campaigning for civil rights, radicals in South Africa campaigning for civil rights in South Africa. Um, now, if you say, well, OK, so what's the difference between an extremist and a radical? Right. So, so the, the people I'm calling radicals are people who basically are, were in favor of fundamental sweeping and immediate change 
in society. That's what makes you a radical. So you don't, you're not prepared to sit back and wait generations for change. You think the changes that are necessary um, are, um, uh, are, are fundamental changes. You are prepared to use extra institutional means in support of your change. Now, extra institutional means means things like, you know, sit-ins, strikes, um, de demonstrations. I think all of these things are among the methods that radicals can use and and have and have used. And these methods have, in fact, been pretty effective. Um, um, arguably more effective than 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 terrorism. Um, in bringing about in bringing about uh, social change. Now, uh, so so I want to say that you know uh, that you can be a radical in the sense that I've described without being an extremist, and and so I you know I want to say that um, you know Martin Luther King Jr. was a radical. I, I wouldn't want to call him an extremist, for example. I think Mandela was a radical, but not an extremist. Um, now, supposing you that we then face your question, which is well, supposing that these radical campaigns. Um, cause distress, mental anguish to certain people. Um, uh, so, you know, maybe the ANC's campaign in South Africa caused anguish, you know, to, to, to white farmers in South Africa. Um, so uh, does that mean that these campaigns are then extremist campaigns uh, in virtue of the distress that they cause? Well, no, I don't think so at all. I, don't, I just, you know, I don't see why one would think of that as itself a form of extremism. Um, I mean, they weren't using, um, by and large, uh, extreme methods in pursuit of their objectives. I mean, the ANC did use terrorism on occasion, but it effectively, I mean, I think on the whole, terrorism was a relatively minor part of, of, its, of, its, of its armory. Um, uh, and political campaigns, you know, of course, are going to cause distress to people who will be adversely affected if these campaigns were successful. Uh, slave owners were adversely affected by the abolition of slavery. Um, maybe some of them were really seriously upset by the fact that they lost their slaves. You know, so is, does that show? Does that mean that people campaigning for uh, for the abolition of slavery were extremists? Well, of course not. Uh, I, I, I see no reason for, for um, you know for connect for, for for using the word extremist to just you know to describe this phenomenon. Um, I, I think part of the problem, uh, maybe this is what underlies your question, is that the word extremist or extremism is now being bandied about in, in a very kind of loose way, you know, so that, you know, um, you know people who feel that they can't um, just say anything they like uh, in polite society anymore because it, they violate social norms, they think of themselves as victims of the new extremism. Well, it's not extremism, right? People who think that they will be adversely affected by um, measures that radical campaigners are campaigning for, um, you know, well, they're not victims of extremism. They're just, you know, they're just, this, the, it, it, ra you know, radical politics is possible and it's not the same as extremism. And there's nothing wrong with, ra with radicalism, but there is something wrong with extremism. Um, and not mixing those two up, I think is quite an important, uh, important task. Okay. Here's an interesting thought experiment. Um, I'm curious if you think this is an extremist movement or just a radical movement. So let's think about last year, Black Lives Matter, all the protests, all the media coverage, um, the influence it had on popular culture and all these other things. But let's imagine it was actually a different movement. Let's imagine it was a, the, called uh, the child freedom movement. And the goal of the child freedom movement is to reduce the age of consent for children to 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So suppose if you were on the other side of this movement, what you were encountering is basically if you said that you believed in the age of consent being 18 or 16, there's a good chance you could lose your job. Whenever you turn on any television show, there's going to be some mention of why uh, you're a child abuser for not wanting to have the age of consent lowered in this way loads of celebrities on every um, award show are lecturing you about why children should have sex at age 10. Um, you feel like you are completely marginalized because you suddenly can't say that the age of consent being 18 was a good thing without potentially losing friends, a job, not being able to have a TV show that you might've had before, um, all these things. When you see uh, activists on television on behalf of this movement, 
uh, and you see a burning building, the uh, newscaster will probably say something like, um, these are mostly peaceful protests, this burning building is an anomaly. Um, and suppose in encountering all the consequences of this highly effective activism, one of which is that you are suddenly stigmatized as a child abuser for believing that the age of consent should be 16 or 18. Do you think that you're just um, feeling uh, a disproportionate sense of, in, of um, intolerance or entitlement in seeing this as an extremist movement? Is it just a radical movement or is there something you think extremist about all this stuff happening in this way, either because of the position or because of just the activism generally? Yeah, I, I find that example really difficult to get my mind around. I mean, it, I, I think I think it's I think it's a sort of <laughs> philosophical thought experiment that is very. I, I find it very hard to connect, you know, connect to it. I mean, I I, I think if, if the point of the example is to say that look, you know, whatever your whatever your view is, even if your view is, you know, you might think of as perfectly reasonable. Um, um, uh, what what how would you feel if you were not able to express it? It because for some reason the mainstream had gone crazy, right? Um, okay, well, right. So if that were to happen, I think I would find it really difficult, and I'd be very upset, and I'd feel that I was being oppressed in some way, right? But but um, that doesn't actually tell you anything at all about you know real cases like Black Lives Matter, which are nothing like the example that you you know nothing like the example that you gave. But but in your view, though, if you were to feel oppressed by the child freedom movement, would you be wrong? Yeah because it's actually what's going on is it's just a radical movement. There's no extremism in it, apart from the yeah. position. Well, I mean, the position, I mean, you, the, the position you would, be, you would be against would be a, 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 an appalling position. It would be, right. uh, a, you know, an in, in, in intolerable position. So would you be wrong? Uh, well, you wouldn't be wrong to oppose it. Would you be wrong to feel that you were being a, you know, persecuted by these by people in the mainstream. No, you wouldn't be wrong. I mean, uh, I, I think that you know this is where we get back to something that came up, you know, very, kind of very early on in our conversation, which is that in all of these things, you can only get so far in these discussions just looking at you know these very abstract features of you know my, you know small minority not being able to say what they want in the face of a big majority. But if you then ask the question, okay, but you know how should we think about this? Well, it depends on what the thing is that the minority feels that it can't say, right? I mean, you have to look, you know, you have to look at the substance. I mean, there was a time, no doubt, in Nazi Germany when, when, when uh, you know, non-Jews couldn't say things, you know, say favorable or sympathetic things about Jews in Germany, Nazi Germany because they got into serious trouble. I mean, uh, were they, you know, were they victims of, you know, the, persecution or oppression yes they you know yes they were but not just because they couldn't say that but rather because the fact they couldn't say that was a symptom of much more general features of this of nazi society that they were a part of they certainly were genuinely uh, genuinely oppressive okay um, so okay. i think you know one has to one always in these cases has to look at the at, you know look at the substance there's no completely substance neutral way of assessing these issues hmm. and what would you say to one of your critics who says that what you just said is, is actually why discussions of extremism are unhelpful. What we should just be worrying about is, is this good politics or is this bad politics? Because regardless of which side you're on, the other side is always going to look extremist if they're campaigning. What would you say to that? Um, I think that's not right. I think that has something to do with, with, with a, you know, something that's happening in politics today. It certainly, certainly isn't, was not the case you know, uh, in, in the US 20, 30 years ago, or in the UK, uh, even even today, that you know the, that you see the other side as extremists. I think that's just not how how it how it how it's been. I think it's a it's a real aberration, you know, uh, in in politics today, um, maybe particularly in American politics today, that each side sees the other side as extremists. I think it's a it's a sign of kind of deep malaise in American politics that this is how things. You know how things have worked. Uh, think things have worked out, um, uh, and and um, uh, I, I mean that doesn't tell you anything about the usefulness, the lack, the you know either either its usefulness or the lack of its usefulness of the concept of extremism. I mean I you know I I can kind of see the place where where you're coming from, which is to say, look, uh, 
I mean, why don't we just get down and discuss the issues, right? And, 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 and what, what's the advantage of labeling positions as extremist or not as extremist, right? Because here's what you think, here's what I think, let's just debate the issues, right? Whether, whether, I, want, whether I think of you as an extremist or vice versa, it's neither here nor there. Well, I think that's right. If you're thinking, you know, thinking about the mechanics of political debate, it isn't necessarily helpful to, you know, to go around calling other people extremists um, just because they disagree with you. But at the same time, one of the things I want to argue in the book, which I think I do argue, is that the, the concept of extremism does pick out something real. I mean, it does pick out um, a feature of, 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 of some ideologies that distinguish them from other ideologies, right? So um, um, I don't think it's just a kind of you know, trivial or insignificant point to describe Nazi ideology as an extremist ideology or to describe you know, the ideology of Stalinism as an extremist ideology. And similarly, I mean, I think that the extremist mindset, I think that there are, there are features um, uh, that, that, I, that, that make up what I call psychological extremism. And of course, the use of extreme methods, I think that's a kind of really fundamental, you know, fundamental point. I mean, you know, why do we call terrorists extremists? And why do we call the people who did 9-11 extremists? Well, you know, the method they used to advance their political objective was by any reasonable standard an extreme method, right? That's why they were extremists. I mean, they could have had the political, I mean, if you say, well, what about their political objective? Was their objective an extremist objective? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a whole other conversation, right? So they, you know, if the objective was to get the United States out of the Middle East, well, is that an extremist objective? Well, there you can have much more of a discussion about whether it's helpful or accurate to call that extremism. But if you're talking about the methods that these people used, the methods were extreme. They were about as extreme as they could get. So they were certainly extremists in that, you know, in that particular, um, particular sense. So if somebody says, yeah, so what's the point of talking about extremism? What, you know, what use is it? Well, if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to say something that's actually kind of quite important, which is that you know, there are methods that it is um, legitimate to use in pursuit of your political objectives. And there are methods that it isn't. And these methods uh, include extreme methods of the sort that Al-Qaeda used on 9-11. Uh, on um, and that's why they, you know, that's one of the reasons they were extremists. Uh, were they ideological extremists? Well, then you need to tell me what the ideology of Al-Qaeda is, right? And that's kind of quite a complicated, you know, uh, com complicated question. Did they have an extremist mindset? Uh, well, I would imagine that the 9-11 hijackers did have an extremist mindset. I mean, it's quite a lot of evidence that they did. Um, and that is something that really distinguishes them, distinguished them from, you know, regular folk who just wouldn't dream of doing what they, you know, what they did. Why not? Because regular folk aren't extremists, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I'm, for the final question, I'm going to ask you something from the position of somebody uh, who is a stronger proponent of extremism than you are. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who is the stronger proponent of extremism who says yeah. the importance of extremism as a conversation topic is it gives us all limits on what we can and can't do when trying to create a better world. So it doesn't mm. matter whether we're on the right side of history. It doesn't matter whether we're Nazis or anti-slavery people. And some of those limits might be in terms of violence and terrorism, which you've discussed, but some yeah. of them might be involved in uh, or related to having psychological mindsets of sorts. So we mm. could even say on this view, uh, Hillary Clinton could in principle be an extremist if she has certain mindsets. Um, yeah. So extremism is about um, just telling everybody, regardless of where they are politically, what sorts of political change are unacceptable morally. What would you say to that view? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I quite grasp the point of that. I mean, um, what, what I think is that is that, you know, extremism, talking about extremism does place limits on what people uh, on changes that the changes that people can be can be uh, campaigning for, uh, but these limits I think are, are good and sensible limits. I, as I say, I don't tend to rule out radical you know radical change or radical action. So um, I don't think I don't think that the, you know the discourse of extremism is really a limitation um, on legitimate political you know political action. Uh, in the case of you know in the case of um, you know what mindsets people have, if you're concerned about that, well. I suppose one way of understanding your question is, you know, could it be that having an extremist mindset can, in some circumstances, be, you know, a good thing? Can it, you know, would it, might it be better for society for progress that some people have an extremist mindset? Uh, 
Um, I, I, I want to say no. I think if you look at the, if you look in detail at, at what I think it makes up extremist mindset, I, 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 I'd want to suggest, I'd want to argue that that it is not, in fact, a good thing for people to have that mindset, and it is not um, conducive to uh, you know, to social progress. This is Greg Scorzo, and that was the Culture and the Offensive podcast. If you like this podcast, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you're interested in any of the other things that we do at Coda Publishing, check us out at www.cultureintheoffensive.com. So stay safe, be courageous, and don't forget to go outside of the comfort zone. And remember, when you hear things that sound wrong or silly or stupid or strange, don't forget to use everything parody and courage. <laughs>